Hello. Good afternoon, everyone. Hello. So this is cool. You get to eat and listen and chime into our conversation. So my name is Tasha Gilroy, and I'm the Global uh, Director for Inclusion Community at VML YNR. And I have the pleasure of hosting this panel today. Uh, it's how to be a parent in advertising, right? It's a subject I think all of our panelists can really are experts at. I think so. No worries. No worries. All right. So I'm going to ask each panelist to introduce themselves and then kind of share a little bit about why they qualify to actually be on this panel. <laughs> Uh, hi, everyone. Well, first of all, show of hands, how many people are parents in here? Okay. Oh, wow. So we can learn from you guys, too. How many people are not but are maybe going to be someday and want to learn how to do it in 45 minutes? <laughs> 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 We're going to teach you. Um, so these, uh, the reason I am here is that I have these three people, and that is a really old picture. Um, that's a picture of my three children. Uh, when their dad was actually battling cancer. And um, he was about 37 when he was diagnosed with cancer and he made it to 40. So I raised those guys by myself. There they are too. Um, but today they are teenagers, which is a whole different experience. So I bring that perspective too. They turned out okay. So um, I just, I think that my perspective is gonna be about how to do it by yourself, if anyone's in that position. Um, the teenage perspective and the to from is really unique. You have a, you have a great, well, you know, people are worried about sippy cups and you know, this brand or whatever, and you think about the problems you have when you have teenagers, it's very different, so. Right. <laughs> by the way, I'm remarried three years ago, uh, and now we have two more, so we're five total. I just can't get them all together <laughs> at the same time for a photo, and they're older, so, yeah. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Gerald Futerker, and um, I am a recent new dad. This is Harvey. Um, my husband and I adopted Harvey from uh, day zero, and we are winging it. So if you're, looking, if you're looking for how to be a parent in advertising, I'll tell you my story, but I'm certainly not telling you what to do. Um, it's, a, it's a daily thing, and every day looks different, and um, you know, try and find some joy in the ride. And there we are, all three of us. I'm Bernadette Rivero. I uh, work in production. I own a production company, and I write. This is a typical work day for me, <laughs> with uh, my child literally on my lap and lap laptop. I have a 24-year-old <laughs> stepdaughter, a 13-year-old production company, 12-year-old daughter, 9-year-old son, 7-year-old daughter, and a 1-year-old baby girl. That's my son in a camera case. They're the same size as a camera. I didn't carry him many places in it, but he was nice and snug in the office. He was literally raised in a production office, hanging from a bouncy uh, uh, swing in the closet because that happened to have the best door frame. The children have always been in the office through the years. Um, I've never had a company or worked in production without a child or multiple children around. They're literally with us, and it's not... Uh, juggling that I talk about as much as just surviving the chaos of both production and uh, parenthood using a lot of technology and techniques blended together. Hi, my name is Reza Rostampiche. Sorry about the last name. Um, <laughs> and this is Maya. Uh, she's six. And um, my story is a little bit different because um, I only have one. It's not that hard. My wife is a freelance artist, she's at home, but the story goes back a little bit when I moved here. My wife and my daughter, they moved before me five years ago, and I had to be separated from my daughter for six months. And that was pretty hard. And after that, I just came here with no job because I wanted to get a job in advertising, and my background just didn't matter because I had no US experience. So the struggle of finding a job, raising a kid, that was a little bit different, but there were, the journey has been great. I've learned a lot from being a parent and applying that into my daytime job, uh, a lot of creative problem solving. And uh, also the reverse, like um, my job has enabled me to do a lot in parenting. Um, 
things been great and I love to share some ideas and get to learn more from you guys. Right. And so here's why I am uh, qualified to moderate this panel. So I, I level up, I'm 2.0. So this is my youngest grandson, Miles. Max, he's two. And my older grandson, Miles, oh. he's five. And here's everybody together. So this is my son, Ty, with Miles and Max, right? So one of the things that we talked about, I had one-on-one -on -one conversations with all the panelists, just to kind of understand their parenting styles, what they were trying to do, how it related to career and making that balance work and how to be successful. So I was lucky enough to actually have one-on-one -on -one conversations. And of course, what comes up first when you talk to parents? Anyone? Time. Time was the first thing that came up uh, in all of our discussions, and it's a balancing act, of course. Um, so for Gerald, I wanted you to actually go a little deeper into, from the start, from when you first actually adopted Harvey, it's, it's been a juggle with time. So I wanted you to kind of share your story that you shared with me uh, sure. about how that adoption process went and how you were able to manage that along with managing what was going on in a successful creative career at the moment. Sure, so um, our time was not on our side. Um, we, um, it, was, it was unheard of how fast the process went for us. Um, in the spirit of the number three, the process was supposed to take between three months and three years, and we were chosen in three weeks. And we had none of the paperwork together. We um, didn't have our little portfolio book together, anything. Um, and we were chosen right away. So I didn't have any time to let my employer know. I didn't know myself. Um, and you would not believe the amount of paperwork that you have to get in order. Um, and so we had to fast track everything. Well, my biggest shoot that I've ever been on um, that I was in charge of was happening in two weeks. So, or actually in one week, and it was two weeks long. So. I had to do a lot of soul searching and um, talking with my husband, but we decided together that I would continue um, the job. I couldn't just leave it flat. The relationships that I had created you know, with my colleagues, with the client, um, and we were shooting real people. So I had already interviewed all the real people and created relationships, so decided to go. And it wasn't just a shoot. I was in um, the deserts of Joshua Tree with no reception. And I was, <laughs> then I flew to the beaches of South Africa. And um, so it was, it was difficult, to say the least. But I really um, I tried to embrace the time. Because okay. some families you know, wait three years or more for, um, to be chosen. So I tried to embrace it. Right. and make positive out of it, because I kind of feel, felt like that was the only way I was going to get through it. And so I did, and I right before we, right before we all left um, on the trip, I decided, I told my husband, I was like, I think I need to attach, um, because I'm going to be unattached um, for a while. So I, I made him <laughs> um, decide on a name with me. And so I used, once we decided on the name Harvey, I used that as kind of like a stick in the mud, a pole in the ground. And, um, you know, I kind of like erected a little tent for our family and just held on to that and focused on him and his name so I could focus on the work. And then, um, you know, eventually build a house from that pole in the ground. Wow. Um, and we, I was three days late. In the spirit of three, again, I was three days late to his birth. My mom, who's here today, went with my husband to pick him up from the hospital. And while, I mean, even saying that now, um, of course, if I were to do something different, I would rather have been there for the birth. But that wasn't in the cards for us. And in, the, in um, embracing that time that was different, I think it's all part of our unique story, right. our beautiful, crazy, quick, and just plain crazy right. um, adoption story. Okay. So. And now I'm proud to have that in whatever form 
Um, that is. That it is. Absolutely. Yeah. But yes, that was really unique and really special um, to even want to adopt, go through that process, but then to, to happen in three weeks and everything happening so quickly and just the adjustment of being a parent and shifting mode, you know, happens so quickly for most folks because it's one day you're not a parent, the next day you are, right? right. So, that, so that was a unique situation. And I also spent um, three weeks, we adopted him from Louisiana, which is where I'm from, and you have to spend three weeks in that state. So I had another to three. Finish, another <laughs> three, I know it's, it's kind of weird. Um, so I had to spend three weeks um, in the post-production process from afar. Oh. So it was a lot of um, FaceTime and late nights. And I really had no, I guess the um, newborn every feeding every three hours actually kind of worked because I had no concept of day or night. I just had bottle, <laughs> diaper, work, sleep, bottle, you know, and trying right. to get it all, all in. Mesh. Right. So I was doing work <laughs> at odd hours, but the whole thing was odd and right. it was crazy and, and weird and beautiful and um, and it was a juggle. It was a, it was a master. That's what you have to become sometimes, a master of juggling all, all the things that go on. And, and it speaking was, it was of, good training, too. Right? Yeah. I can't imagine. Rest. Right. Right. And, it, of course, having a partner also helps because that's the, also the nuance of juggling, right? So Absolutely. all of that, right? But speaking of juggling, Bernadette, having five, mm. um, three under the age of... 12. 12, right? So mastering juggling is nuanced for you in a different way. And we talked about sometimes having to manage work or do things, the bottom of a bunk bed, one in the morning, mm -hmm. baby on, on the other side of your shoulder, um, but getting things done. Yeah. yeah. So you talk about how you're able to do all of that while, you know, managing all these lives. Uh, you know, we use the word multitasking, but I just try to do everything um, to knock out two birds with one stone. So uh, I work at night like a lot of parents. I think once the kids are in bed, I have this huge stretch of time, which is helpful because I'm a, a night owl. From about 8.30 until 2 in the morning, I can get tons of work done. It's mm. nice and quiet. And I have time in the earlier evening with, you know, with the family. But I made sure we got a, a big bunk bed. It can actually sleep two up top and two down on the bottom. And I will nestle at night with the kids on top of me to put them to sleep so we get some snuggle time and I put on music and I can taunt them with whatever I want like Elvis or Janis Joplin or some Tom Petty. They don't care as long as they have me time Amazing. with me and I'll work until they fall asleep and then I just stay there and it's my happy place because it's calm. Um, I, I feel like I'm spending time with the kids. They're used to mom working in bed and getting things done. But the flip side of that is when I hire on new people into the company or when anyone's working with me, I have to tell them flat out, you're going to get emails from me at weird times of the day and night, sometimes on Saturdays or Sundays, and I will say in the email, do not address this until Monday. But I have to give them a forewarning. Just because I'm working late at night for me, because that works for me and my family, don't do it for you. For you. But right. laying down that line in the sand so people know that they're going to get email communications from me or tasks or see things being done at, at strange hours of the day and night. It's just part of juggling the parenting with the production company. Right. That's a great tip. Yeah. And so nowadays there's, you know, so many tools and so many apps and so many things to help parents manage, you know, work and life. I had none of that uh, when I was <laughs> raising mine. Um, but can each of you talk about maybe some of the tools or some of the things or, or maybe the tricks that you use to help you keep things kind of in order and, and, and on the way, if you can? I'm old school too. I okay. use a, I, we have a big chalkboard, <laughs> like a wall, a chalk wall in the kitchen. Um, and it's sort of the like hub. hub and the kids love it. We sit down, they look at the week and they're like, okay, they ask all the questions because as they get older, you really just become a personal assistant. Mm -hmm. And you're and a driver. An Uber driver, exactly. So it's just, you know, it's about like, where's everybody going to be? If you don't have a ride, what's your plan? Um, you know, and we, we catch things together. And it's teaching them a lot of organizational skills, too, because they see it up there. They take ownership for it as well. Right. So that's great. And just a regular calendar. So for me, it's all about calendars for tools, producer stuff. I think mine's a calendar, too. Mm -hmm. I hate to have the same answer. It's okay. <laughs> But um, I'm such a visual person that if I get a schedule or um, you know any sort of list, I have to put it into blocks. Mm -hmm. And so I can block it out. And when my husband's going to be at work and when I need to kick in, and then I even put in work time. So I'm like, I need to yeah. be, um, oh, I, I, it's actually, it's more like think time. It's like for this amount of time, even if I'm 
um, picking up Harvey from school or doing something, I know I need to be thinking about this. So I set myself up for when I actually sit down to work. Okay. Because okay. then I'm ready. I don't okay. have to sit down, sit down and like, and then you know, um, and right. I don't yeah. have to like, I'm already in there. And, um, something when I first talked to Kat, um, about speaking, we were discussing like the hour and when you're charging and advertising, I'm freelance. So when I'm charging, you know, everybody knows it's either hourly, day rate, or project based. And so for me, it was hourly. That made a lot of sense because I can slot in my hours on my, on my calendar and they're at this color and everything. But then um, as we kind of started talking about it, I was like, you know, that's not really fair because my hour is so productive because it has to be. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I can't, I don't put my feet up. I don't brainstorm, you know, I have to do that in between moments. Right. And so when I sit down and, you know, just having experience, like I just don't let the wrong thoughts get in and go down a path. Like I'm you're just working, like, boom, 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 hours boom. are like, hard is, working They hour. are hard working hours. And I'm not counting when I'm picking him up from school, okay. even though my brain is there. So we were laughing about it and, and she was like, well, with the number three, you should charge three times the amount for those hours <laughs> because they're, they really are so productive, are so productive because productive, they have to right. be. I mean, you have to juggle and you have to get the, the right amount of sleep. So yeah, it's the calendar. I'm, right. I'm anti-calendar because in production, you can set the best calendar <laughs> in the world. And at the last minute when everything set, all blow up. the celebrity horse won't be available until the next day. So your calendar goes out the window. <laughs> So I've had to do a, a separate technique, which is, I don't know if anyone's heard of the tomatino. It's where you work in 15 minute increments by setting a, a, a kitchen timer, and you only work on one thing for 15 minutes, and when the timer goes off, you know, you, you, you up it to like 30 minutes or an hour. Well, the problem with the tomatino is if you have kids, they love kicking it around like a <laughs> ball, and they love playing with it, and when the timer goes off, it wakes everybody in the house up. So there's an app called Self Control that works for Macs, for Macintosh computers, and I will set it for 15 minutes at a time, and it locks me out of the internet. So the only thing I can do is focus on one thing, work. and then when that's up, I can start something else. And it works so well that I managed to write and produce 26 episodes of television right after and before I had um, my second child, because I did it in 15 minute chunks. And the ironic thing is I, I wrote and produced um, a show called Patty's Mexican Table. It's a cooking show, right? And you would think I'd be great at elaborate cooking, and I'm not. The other tool I rely on is a crock pot, <laughs> because yes. I feel as a parent, if I can just get one hot-ish meal on the table a day, then I've, I've done my duty. Yeah. And with a crock pot, and there's a reason that people have used these things for like 2,000, 3,000 years, burying a hot <laughs> pot under the earth uh, and then covering it with and covering hot it, rocks. Yes. Now, thankfully, you just plug it in, but you need a protein and a sauce, and that's it. So I'll throw, you know, like uh, beef <laughs> and barbecue sauce, and then we'll throw it on, you know, buns at night, and my, my, I'm done. Right. right. But you mix that with a rice cooker, and I can get dinner on the table by doing four or five minutes of work in the morning. And I can't live without that crock pot. Like, if there's a fire, I'm grabbing my children in that and that crock, crock pot, pot before I work. <laughs> Raisa? Uh, there are so many different tools these days and, and in different levels. Like, everyone's using a calendar. I, I, I created a pointing system for my daughter to oh. get her motivated to do stuff. Like, she can earn points by, by, by doing chores, and then she can spend those points on different things that she likes. If she wants to go to a museum, she wants to get sushi or whatever. Um, the other thing is like um, every one of us who has kids have heard this question, are we there yet? Are we there yet when we're driving mm -hmm. with kids? So Maya was around three and a half, four, and she didn't have a really good sense of time. What I came up with was she understands songs, she loves music, so every song is like three to four minutes. So, and she could count. So count 10 songs and we'll be there. Mm. So I broke down the time for her into songs and she could understand it and she was enjoying it and she wasn't asking that question anymore. <laughs> but she grew up and um, she got bored again. She was not paying attention to number of songs. So podcasts, best tools ever. <laughs> There's so many great podcasts for kids these days like NPR, all the good production houses, they, they're putting a lot of good podcasts, and there are some, some of them are so great. The topics are amazing. Like There's one ethic podcast for children. They cover so much. That, like The 
heavy topics that even us as adults, we sometimes find it hard to discuss, but they have experts on the topics and they talk to children in great ways and there are so many different things. But other than that, I think life gave me the greatest tool of all, which is gratitude. Coming from a different background, living in a really unstable society, not in terms of safety, uh, it's different than what we see on the news, honestly, but it's uncertain because you may go to sleep one night and wake up tomorrow morning and all your clients left the market. It's just like that. Right. And when you live in that kind of environment, you get to understand, okay, whatever life puts on my table, I have to have deal to with it with. and get right. the positive out of it. Right. Yeah. And, and I'm sure part of all of that is then teaching Maya, how to manage that, right? Because you understand how to deal with those things and, and waking up and everyone's left the market or coming to the country without a job and managing those things. So you're, you're passing on that tradition um, and helping her to learn how to manage difficulty or situations that might be hard. Exactly. It, it may be a little bit of challenge because of the duality of the situation. Like what I went through is so different than what Maya is going through these days. Right. And just to make sure that she understands the value of what she has today, it's, uh, it's pretty hard because I have a different frame of reference. Right. And in terms of talking about traditions and passing on and values, um, we've also hit on some of the cultural traditions, traditions about, you know, having family connection, what to do. And so some of the things that we talked about was having family dinner or family time. And we had an interesting conversation about what you do might be a little different from what some of your other friends that are doing with their families. Yeah, I mean, we make family dinner our priority. And a lot of my friends um, don't in this day and age. It's hard to get everybody when they're older to like home at the same time. But that's always been a priority. We love to cook, so both, um, my husband and I uh, love to cook, and even when it was just me, I loved to cook. And I basically told you know my manager that it was important for me to be home at dinner time. I might get back on my laptop. I'll probably get back on my laptop, but I want to be home physically at that time. It just felt like the right thing for me as a mom to feel like I was um, because I you know as a working parent, as a single working parent, I wasn't. I felt like I wasn't around a lot. And I hear people talk about how we're always feeling guilty. Yes. So knowing that I was like, that was how I could kind of like deal with my guilt was like, well, I'm always there at dinner time. So it made me kind of feel good. Um, but it also, I think, made a huge difference in our family dynamic. We do this thing when we start dinner where we talk about the best part of our day and the worst part of our day. And then um, I recently read this, you know, those sort of like articles that get sort of passed around. I don't know who wrote it, but it was about raising teenage daughters. And uh, one of the tips she had was that at the dinner table, you are like encouraged to brag about your day because you can't brag, you know, with your friends or whatever, but you can brag with your family. So especially for girls, this was your moment to just brag away and you kind of like were for you're forced to brag and say something positive that happened to you. We also um, do what I learned today instead of like what what you learn at school today. It's like today I learned, learned. and it can be anything. And then uh, another one is what made me laugh today. So just, oh, it's a good one. and you know, the reality is like some dinners are terrible, especially like when they're toddlers, it sucks. <laughs> when they're teenagers, <laughs> it can suck. But you just keep powering through. And I, I feel like maybe one out of every five family dinners is good. Right. They'll share <laughs> without you having to pull it out the of other them. Four, They'll actually it's talk to like, you. Oh my God, why are you guys fighting over past how you pass that to him? Like, right. you know, just like every, they just annoy each other all the time. And then toddlers, of course, it's like everyone's it's just dropping stuff, right. having their meltdowns. Right. Teenagers and toddlers, right. by the way, are very similar. <laughs> yeah, very similar. Right. So, you know, you just have meltdowns, whatever. But I think it's worth it for one out of five. Mm -hmm. You know, when the more people you have, the more dynamics you have in your family. It's crazy. Your dynamics are insane. But uh, so you're just oh, somebody's going to be off that day. So we get that we get that enough that I think it's worth it still. Right. And so for me, thinking about tradition, it, I think because I'm a grandmother now, I think more about my legacy. Mm -hmm. Right. So what things will they yeah. will I leave with them that will become legacy that they will pass on? Um, and because I get to do cool, fun stuff, because I'm you know, BB. I'm grandmother now, so I get to do the easy stuff. Um, so that's you know important to me, legacy and the traditions, 
But Risa, what about you? Having been here in the U.S. and culturally, there's different traditions here than, than your native country. Yeah, I guess my gets the best of both worlds because we have a lot of celebration in, in our culture and we try to keep that alive. Um, fortunately, I live in LA. There's a huge Persian community in LA. So things are alive in the community too. Like every Persian New Year, we go to the celebrations. And there are so many good values in those moments and occasions that I try. we try to make her understand what every symbol means. Like we have so many different sculptures of pomegranate in our house and that's a symbol of love and we need to make sure that she understand or Persian poetry is beautiful so we try to infuse culture and our traditions into our parenting and also uh, we don't have huge families but um, the Persian culture is very like we have a close community even back in Tehran so empathy is is a huge thing in our culture mm -hmm. and that coming from that background helps me a lot even in my work to understand my colleagues, to understand consumers better because I'm a strategist. Right. And I try to make sure that Maya gets that empathy too. Like mm -hmm. try to look at things from other people's point of view. Mm -hmm. And in terms of the family, so you left family back in your native country in Tehran? Um, no, I was waiting for my interview for six months back in Tehran. Why? Because my wife and my daughter, they had the green card. Okay. So they moved before me right. and I was waiting for my case to be approved and get my visa. And it was pretty hard. She was, Maya was one and a half year old. And mm -hmm. uh, honestly, it was a lot of responsibility on my wife's shoulder, just moving alone to a new country. Uh, we had some friends. But other than that, uh, when I moved, not having a job, um, it was pretty challenging, as I mentioned earlier. Right. But it also gave me the opportunity to catch up with Maya because I was away for six months and just that year, having that extra year, it kind of kept me hopeful and uh, positive. And if it wasn't for some friends, uh, some of them are in this room, that they helped me out. They, they taught me about the industry, how things work here. Uh, if it wasn't for them and my wife, um, I don't know if I could make it. Honestly, I don't want to go back to that neighborhood that I lived back then because it makes me feel bad because right. I was in between jobs and I didn't have anything to look forward to. Mm. But in terms of the community and family, most of you, it's interesting, either come from a big family or are with a spouse or partner that are come from a big family, right? And so managing that, do you think it's different or easier having a large family and that a large family while you're raising children or do you think it's a little bit more challenging because you have a large family and you're raising children? I feel like we're kind of in between the two worlds. Uh, I come from a family that's, uh, I only have a, a sister but I have hundreds of cousins. I mean it's a huge family. My favorite aunt has seven kids. My husband's one of five. My mother-in-law was one of 14 or 17. My father-in-law was from 14 or 17 too. So there's a lot of aunts and uncles and, and things like that but in different parts of the country. My husband and I are in Los Angeles alone. We don't have family. Even before starting a family and understanding the vagaries of production that's up and down and you don't know where you're at from one week to the next, we had to really talk about how we were going to manage it and not have more than we could handle. Right. Um, you know, and we have, it never feels like a big family until I had to take two Ubers to the airport this summer. <laughs> so the first time it hit me, like, this is, this is a little larger than I was expecting. But um, it's, it was more about figuring out how working in the advertising industry, working in production where it's difficult to judge you know, what life is going to be like in a week or a month's time without having any family or backup system, how we could manage that. And I had to patch together like a supply chain of babysitters. Mm -hmm. So I always have four or five on tap. Right. So if something goes wrong with plan A, I have plan B, I have plan C. In the same way that on set, if you lose your generator and your backup generator, you have, you know, like another plan to back it up. There's um, a couple of apps, um, Urban Sitter is one. There's a new one in our neighborhood called Bambino, which is just neighborhood teenagers, right? So it's not like the big, you know, background checked uh, babysitters. It's just like the girl down the block who happens to share, you know, the street with you. Um, and I will sometimes have a babysitter come in 
and they, I will pay them to stay there for two hours while I just hang out in the back and make sure they don't chop anyone's head off with an ax. Right. Right. Like I'm just trying to make sure that they get along with the kids and everything's fine. And if that works, then I'll go out at another time and leave them for an hour. And then by that point, like we get to know them and then I start auditioning another babysitter. And I had to do that because without family, what do you do when a child gets sick? What do you do um, when you have to be somewhere for a meeting? Um, and a lot of people don't know this, but in, if you're in a bigger city, there's sometimes drop-in care at the hospitals if you have a true emergency and your child is sick. Like if it's a visa meeting or the meeting of your life and your child has a high fever and you cannot take them home, if you call in advance, if you find out what local hospitals do it, you can take a child there in a pinch in an emergency. Yeah. And that's good to know when you really don't have family have or family backup around. or someone you can rely on. Right. Gerald, Daisy? I come from a very large family. I'm one of six. Um, and I think actions speak louder than words. Um, so um, we have now relocated to New Orleans right. to be around family. family. Um, and it's, it's definitely for a support system. You know, we overlap each other and we all have to be there. You, know, you, have, to, you have to be there for them and they're there for you. But also our main reason to do it was to surround Harvey with the same kind of upbringing that I had with a large family. So. There's seven grandkids now. Um, four were born last year, and they're all running around together. So, just nice. And then, so my situation is now different because now I'm in advertising in New Orleans. Right. And um, I'm starting my own um, kind of consulting business. I'm, you have to constantly evolve to the needs of where you are. Um, so I'm doing work with New York clients and also building up some, some local. Um, work as well, but so, you know, I, I went to New Orleans for it to be easier for family, but now it's more challenging for work. For work, mm. right. What yeah, I did the same thing when I was pregnant with my daughter, moved to, back, from LA back to the Bay Area in California to be closer to family, right. because I knew, um, and this was before my husband got sick, he had just finished graduate school, and um, I just knew, oh my gosh, we're gonna have three, we're gonna need help, and I wanted that relationship I loved my relationship with my grandparents. I wanted my kids to have a relationship with their grandparents. So we moved back up, and thank God we did, because I don't know what I would have done when, when everything happened, happened. To not have right. that support um, and be able to take care of kids being sick. I, I, did, I did have family, family there to there help. To help. Yeah. Right. Now, Bernadette and Daisy, you both have uh, are raising teenagers, right? <laughs> um, and that is nuanced and can be challenging. So. What about being a parent of a teenager is helping you be better at work? Oh my God, I don't remember you asking that question. <laughs> That's a great one. Mm -hmm. um, it's, uh, you, I don't know, how many people have teenagers here? Okay, so you, you really kind of let a lot of things go, right? And you, um, you're much more, you're patient in a very different way than the toddler way. Uh, and you start to get judged a lot, which is new. Like your your kids love you when you're little, and they when they're little, and they want you home, and they love you so much, and so great. You're such a hero, and then all of a sudden you go from hero to zero. Right. So you are humbled, which I think is really important when you're managing a team to be really, really humble, um, and to self-reflect, which you do a lot because they point out all your flaws all of a sudden. <laughs> so I think that's that's, that's really part. that's helped me. Okay. Mm -hmm. Same thing here. I, you know, I was very blessed to have my stepdaughter with us. You know, I met her when she was seven. She's 24 now. She works in the industry. She works in production, which is nice. But I know going into it again on the second round now that my daughter's 12, there's this very short period of time where they love you so much. And you're such a cool person. And then all of a sudden, you're not. <laughs> so it's like a tomatino, st you know, a timer clicking down. You know, there's only so many weekends left with my 12 year old where <laughs> she's going to want to be with us. Right. And it makes me really treasure the baby because I've got a nice mm -hmm. long stretch there. But it also makes me think, you know, how can I? Uh, you can't make everybody happy all of the time. You can't. But you can try to make their day a little bit better and you can get through the next event or mm -hmm. make sure that they focus on education. And, you know, now I know, like, if, if, if anything goes wrong, I can just say, look, you're, you're only going to be a teenager for, like, four or five years, and you don't ever have to see me again if you don't want to. Right. 
Um, you know, but right now we need to focus on being a family and having those family dinners and doing events on the weekend when we're together um, because the time is so short. Like really, even with the little ones or a six-year-old, mm -hmm. set the clock, you know, take real big advantage of the time that you do have. Right. And so, so the days you've been are long, the see. years are short, right? Yeah, that's yeah. What it feels the, yes, like. absolutely. Um, but see, now you actually have a child that is an adult and they do come back to you. Mm -hmm. So the hope right. is, <laughs> but they do. I've witnessed all the values that I pushed into my son and all the things that I thought he wasn't hearing and all the things that you thought just went away um, when they became teenagers or young adults, they actually revert and you start to see it play out, especially watching him be a parent to his children. I see a lot of me play out. You know, the whole phrase of you say something like, did I just say that? I just sound just like my mother. And then he's like <laughs> saying those things. I'm like, you know, I used to say those things to you. And he's like, right, mom, right, right, right. It, it comes back. So yeah. that's the good news. I'm seeing glimmers of that. And that's, right. that's like somebody last night that we, we, we were talking to, I think it was a friend of yours, was saying that, that she was taking care of a youngster again after not being around little people. And it reminded her that she was a really good parent. And she, I said, well, why didn't you, what do you mean it reminded you? What happened? She's like, no, I just, I guess I was just so critical of myself all the time. And I'm like, same. Like, we're so critical. We, um, we're, our, we're our worst critic. And I think we're all doing fantastic jobs if we're loving them and we're listening, you know? Yes. And, and I think that that's going to go so far. And they're supposed to go through these, these, you know, personality changes as they go into their cocoons to become the adults they're going to be eventually. And I think a lot of the things that, that we're doing will resonate with them, and it'll, it'll come back around, like you said. Yeah, absolutely, it, it does. Now, um, and the pleasure in seeing that happen, and they become your friends, and they, your confidant, and all those things do come back. So um, as you can see, I am the grandmother of biracial children. So what happens sometimes, especially when I'm out with Miles, right? Because Miles is ginger, all red. Um, and his mom is Irish German. Um, so sometimes we'll be out and I, you know, you forget cause you're just with your grandkids so you're hanging out. Um, so sometimes we'll be out at a store or we'll go to some of his favorite places to play. Um, and automatically people kind of assume, Oh, how long have you been working for that family? Oh, oh is they, are they good to work for? You know, they automatically assume that I'm the nanny. Right, right, so, and I know this might have happened to you a couple of times too, um, Bernadette, so what do you talk to about your children when, when you're out with them, right? Because Daisy, you have a son who is on the spectrum, and so when people realize or say silly things out in the world about that, um, or Gerald, when you're with your husband and they realize that you're married and, and you have Harvey, um, you know, what are some of the things that you do or how do you manage that or what do you say to people? Um, when they say those wild, crazy things? Well, it's, it's not a couple of times that I've gotten mistaken. It's constant. It's like probably about once a week, um, mm. sometimes twice in the same day, uh, that I get mistaken for my child's nanny. There's something about Los Angeles, and when they see me with the child, they just presume, oh, do you take care of other children? Mm -hmm. And there's been days that are bad enough in advertising that I've thought, well, maybe I should just say yes and see how much they'll <laughs> so pay. Pay me. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I, I prob they probably pay faster than some clients, too. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's awkward. It throws my day off. You know, like I try to have just like a good work day and I'll suddenly, you know, like just stop to grab an orange at a farmer's market or something with my child and people will start asking like, oh, you know, like how long have you been working for the family for? And then I find myself losing part of my work day, which is very precious to me, right? Like if I set a timer, there's only so many hours in the day and I start second guessing myself is it, was I dressed too nice? Was I dressed incorrectly? Was I dressed too down? Do I just look like a really upscale nanny? What did I do wrong? <laughs> and I don't like that sense of doubt. Right. right? But we do have to have these conversations with our children that, ch that families come in all varieties. All different types. We're lucky to be in Los Angeles where you can see every variety of family under the sun. There's, there's every combination you can think of and they can see that. Um, you know, but it's, they're, they're difficult conversations because people just make really you know, wrong assumptions about families. I have a younger sister who's uh, mentally handicapped. So when we're out, it looks, she looks like, you know, just anyone else on the street, but she has the speaking capacity and understanding capacity of an eight-year-old, okay. right? So, and I'm, I'm very happy that my children have seen that and been involved in that and seen the Special Olympics and seen that don't make assumptions based on what you see, see. or what you assume, mm -hmm. talk to and get to know the people behind it. Um, right. And, and try to learn a little. Right. 
What about you, Daisy? Do, do people react differently or? Yeah, when he was younger, Will, the brown-haired one over there, luckily he's a cutie, so he doesn't <laughs> get too much. But he, he, would, um, he was very impulsive because he didn't know what was going on with him. And he, was, he spoke late, uh, so he'd get frustrated. And I would constantly get calls from school uh, that he was in trouble again. Um, and I, if I didn't have his twin brother, they look nothing alike, but they're twins, to, um, to, to sort of gauge his developmental process, I may, might not have known right away, but it became very clear in the older he got. So he's, um, he's definitely on the spectrum of autism. He says things that are completely off topic. He's got social issues, um, and people, when he was younger, didn't understand, and they'd be very judgmental. And it was really difficult for his twin brother, too. Right. Um, but, you know, I don't have any advice for that. You just, you just, just have to be strong, it. and you have to just manage through it, and you have to just assume people don't know the whole story. Mm -hmm. um, and then it teaches you to not judge until you know the whole story as well. Right. Do you think it would be different for any of you? This is a question for all of you. If you had been in a different industry, you think your parenting style or the way you have to manage as a parent would be different? better I, or for worse? Yeah, I never, I, I started in advertising when I was 14. I had an English teacher that helped me get a job inside of an ad agency so I would no longer work in a supermarket. And uh, everyone in that in-house ad agency had a family and talked about having families and had photos of their kids everywhere. So it never occurred to me that you couldn't have a family and work in advertising at the same time. I know if I worked in, in journalism like I did before this, um, because there was a period of time where I worked in broadcast news, I wouldn't have a family. I wouldn't have anyone to come home to. The divorce rate of the people I worked with was about 100%. There was a lot of broken families. And I wanted uh, a family. I wanted someone to be excited when I came home. And I wanted to be excited when someone walked through the door in the same way. And advertising gave me that. I love this industry because of it. And it's hard to have a child and be in any industry. But advertising, at least for me, um, gave me the space to see other families working and being in advertising and think that maybe I could do that too. Right. Like so? I think things are changing a lot in the industry. Like we cannot generalize. Like okay, having being a parent in advertising is hard. Um, it depends, honestly, where you live and where you work. Like mm -hmm. I'm very fortunate. The agency that I'm working at, all the senior leadership, they have children, so they very understanding of what's going on in your life, and um, it's also very diverse. So today, it's not an issue for me, but I'm sure it's. Um, it's a check mark on my list. If I, if I want to change job or relocate, I have to think about that. Okay, what kind of environment am I walking into with my life situation? Like raising a kid, there's there's definitely high expectations in some of the agencies more than the others. But still, again, I'm I'm living in LA. I'm very fortunate to to be in that culture because right. it's very diverse. It's a melting pot. Okay, so you're you're clear and calculated about what agency cultures you're connecting yourself with. Exactly, right? absolutely. And so, Gerald, you're freelancing, right? So, For me, it's about establishing accountability from the get-go. Um, you know, uh, if you're working for someone, it's a relationship. It's um, just as much needs to be um, successful for them as it does for you. Right. So I kind of lay it out there as, in terms of accountability where, you know, I care about my work. I care about my projects. Um, I also care about my family, of course, but I, it, it's about saying, like, trust me. Right. Like, I will get the job done. I will do it to the best of my ability. I will do it what I think is right. Um, and then I think once you kind of lay that out there, for me, it's been successful so far because I'm like, don't worry about what time the emails are coming through. You know, Harvey could have a fever. It's not really any of your business. You know, I'm just going to get it done, and you can trust me. And if, and I've certainly been in circumstances where that wasn't going to work for them, and you're like, cool, no problem. Mm -hmm. I mean, really, like, to, when, when life shows you signs, you know, take the signs. Take the signs. Um, so I, for me, it's about establishing that and making sure it's going to work for both parties. Mm -hmm. um, and then you just kind of, that's why I said I don't have any advice for anybody. I just, <laughs> you're just figuring it out. Right. You just figure it yeah. out. They don't come with manuals, these little people that grow up to be big people. Um, so that wraps our time. I'm just going to quickly open up for questions. Does anyone have any quick questions in the audience? Can you all talk about what you do for, for living in advertising? I'm curious to hear what you're seeing in other jobs and if you think hours are as demanding as advertising jobs for you, because I find that people have the best balance. 
Oh, here comes a microphone. I think you need to. I can hear I spoke you. Spoke too soon. So my question is, what do your significant others do for a living? In, and not necessarily specifically, but is the hour demand as much as it is in advertising? Because I often find that people who have the best balance, they also have a balanced marriage where like the spouse doesn't have the hours that advertising has. And unfortunately, my husband has some flexibility in his schedule, but but it's only on certain days at certain times. There's not flexibility within, so then it lands on me to have to deal with all the kids being sent home right. because they have a fever, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm just curious to hear. I think I'm the spoiled one, so because my wife, she's a freelance we artist. We all want wives. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Well, <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, she works from home, so she has a very flexible schedule. But that doesn't mean that sometimes that we we end up in like a really hard situation. The other day, she had her interview for citizenship, and. She, Maya didn't have school on that day, so we had to manage our time. But still, I'm, I think I'm just point one on the plan. Mm -hmm. Well, um, my husband is in restaurant business, so it looks like it works perfectly on paper, right? You know, go back to my calendar, like all the, all the boxes are filled with colors um, because I work during the day, he works at night. And that's how it was in New York when we had Harvey and we were we were working it out and so the it was jam packed and it worked right but it was terrible it was not working at all um, we like we didn't even exchange you know the baby it was it it was not um, it was not a uh, successful happy situation and so we're still working to resolve that today um, but I think that's important because to realize that just because it looks like it works, it doesn't. Um, and also, like, we had the perfect opposite schedule. So it's, it's I don't know. It's, um, no there's, there's no answer. answer. There's no, no easy answer. answer sometimes. Yeah, and I, I'm joking when I said that, but that's how I felt when I was a single parent. It's like, I, I would be in meetings and, you know, you'd, I knew as oftentimes being the only woman in a meeting, all the guys who were there, had somebody at home and I knew them so I mean not, not to mail bash but a lot no, of them it's lot like of them had a wife you have home. your assistant at home right. that knows that like it's taco Tuesday tomorrow so the kids need two dollars and you know every little detail that that it, it does tend to fall on the mom a lot well, one parent I think since I don't have an assistant at home I don't yeah. have a wife at home yeah. when we are both working I'm finding it, again, I don't have the answer. <laughs> I'm finding it really difficult because there is no um, expectation, mm. right? There's no like, well, the mom can pick him up. Yeah, um, like how do you say, well, I'm gonna do, you know, right. splitting and I, that up. I think my old agency also found that tricky because, you know, that obviously being in New York and they were all for our situation. Um, you know, they were our cheerleaders, but also they didn't know, how, we didn't know how to, figure that part of it out right. and because there wasn't a primary I think they were calling it a primary responsible parent which I just was like that's garbage right <laughs> everybody <laughs> like it's not because primary responsible here. I'm like parent. that's that right. doesn't make any in sense in that scenario so, that, that means that your job is less and right. you can yeah. go and, and leave not. and pick up and, mm -hmm. and so it was it was interesting for us to try and map that territory and, and figure out words and names that weren't offensive, I guess, <laughs> you know, and we're like trying to figure it out. But at the end of the day, that's why I go back to accountability, because I'm like, if I have to leave, I have to leave. And that's what that and is. And that's what it is. And you can trust me. Right. And you can trust me to figure it out and to get the job done. And I, that, that is that's how it what I'm, be. right, that's right. what I'm yeah. promising to them, so. Right. So, um, I, I, one more question. Actually, there was a woman over here who wanted to ask And I just got the first, I like daddy better. Oh. Oh, wow. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. After my bathroom cry with my feet up so that nobody could see it was me crying in the stall, um, I kind of just thought to myself, and it's a lot of what you're saying about it'll come back, he'll grow up knowing, right? Somebody they do. make me feel oh, better. Totally. <laughs> totally. Absolutely. Um, it was just one of those things where it's like, wow. You I, that could have happened even if you were home. 
I mean, mm -hmm. you know, right. it probably does. Mm -hmm. if right. I suck. Dad's, dad's right. much dad's better. Dad's so much fun. better. But, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I just was see, trying to see if anybody's had that yet. I have it every day. Mm -hmm. um, daddy, daddy, I'm Papa. Yeah. My mom likes to tell me that P's are much harder than D's <laughs> for <laughs> children to learn. But um, yeah, daddy comes home and it's, I mean, the doors fling open and they're, and I'm just like the, the disciplinarian. Like when I have a second, I'm, you know, doing this and, um, and it's a, I think it's a constant struggle, but, um, you know, there, there, I think there's different roles for everybody, um, in, in everybody's unique situation. And, um, I, th I'm just hoping, like she said, I'm hoping that it comes back. It does. Um, I promise. Sometimes they will bring it up. Oh, remember that time you weren't there? I, I won that award at school. Right, right, right. But I was making money to feed you. Yeah. So, oh, Make well. that money. <laughs> right. Well, thank you, everyone. Um, just want to shamelessly plug that my agency, VML YNR, is actually going to be sharing the data research from a um, survey we conducted and partnered with 3% on about parents in ad land, and that happens at 2.15 today, uh, and I think that's in room 325. So if you want to hear some more data and statistics about how to manage and what it's like in terms of talent in advertising and being a parent, um, please come check that out. But I want to thank all of my panelists for the discussion today. And one more thing, so there's a woman who actually uh, created a woman woman show. Um, her name uh, escapes me right now, but um, it's Stephanie, Stephanie Perillo. She actually created a woman show about the challenges that she had working in advertising, dealing with a son who was in a horrific car accident and then subsequently passed away. Um, and she has some challenges with time off and family medical leave, so please check out her story and understand that some of the things that you might be dealing with are something that uh, the industry is also trying to, to work through. All right? All right, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us.